All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here to celebrate International Women's Day. I hope that you have all signed um, the signing sheet because Sydney, I don't know if she's gonna have the scan code, but either way, I wanna make sure everyone gets their credit. Even if you are part of the class or not, we would just like to have uh, everybody documenting and participating. So we're really excited to be, um, you know, International Women's Day is just really a great day to celebrate women, but also to celebrate difference, celebrate so many different opportunities that are presented to all. And so this particular session, we have two great alums of K-State and the College of Agriculture, and they both have a connection. So Andrea was in our first Project Impact a scholar program and Jennifer McDonald at that time she was with Cargill and she was part of the initial uh, recruitment and when we established the funding for um, our project impact and these are various scholarships of students that came through our program on multicultural academic program success. So I just thought it was so great that the two of them could be presenting at this time. And as you know, Dr. Wiley always collaborates. So today we're with K-State Manners, and that's our Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences. And Andrea was one of our members um, when she was here at K-State. And Jennifer McDonald, when she actually was able to attend one of our national conferences. And so the other group that we're partnering with, of course, is my office, the Diversity Programs Office, and Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Kappa Pi chapter that is here on campus. And this organization is the first Greek lettered organization for African American females. And it was founded at Howard University. And so we have two of our representatives here and we have one that will speak to introduce herself and then also introduce Brenda who's with her. <clears throat> Hi everyone, happy International Women's Day. My name is Kara Bruce, and I am a senior in the Kappa Pi chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I'm currently studying social sciences and pre-law. And like Dr. Wiley said, we are the first Greek letter sorority for African-American women. So I think it's even more important for us to celebrate International Women's Day due to, due to that fact. And our sorority is just aimed at service to all mankind and the better men of just like black people in society. And so I'm here with my sorority sister, Brenda Hurd, who's also a senior at K-State. She's majoring in political science and pre-law. So thank you. And we're so proud of this collaboration and very happy with uh, being here today. All right, thank you so much. All right, so we have Jennifer McDonald who will be introduced later and she's also a member of our sorority. And then Andrea who, is very, this, both of them are special to me. But Andrea, like I said, she was one of the first recruits that we had in 2009. And now where she is in veterinary medicine, she's following her dream. And I'm just so proud of her. So I just really hope all of you can embrace their presentations today, ask them questions and understand their road to equity, understand what they went through to get where they are. So and it should encourage all of you to be able, whatever your dream is, that you can fulfill it. All right, so it's great having everybody and I'm gonna turn it over to Summer. Thank you. Well, hey everybody, I think, um, I think a lot of you have met me before. My name is Summer Santiana. I am the Diversity Programs Office Coordinator. So I get to work with the lovely Dr. Wiley day in and day out, um, eight to five. And I get to help with awesome events like this um, and get awesome, get to meet awesome people like Andrea and Jennifer, and we're just really excited to have them. Uh, so to get started, I'm going to have Selena Gilio, Gilliot come up here and introduce herself and give you guys the biographies of these two amazing women that we get to hear from today. Hi everyone, my name is Selena Gilliot and happy International Women's Day. Um, I am the current K-State Manners uh, Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences. I'm the treasurer, and I am a Project Impact Map Scholar and a sophomore here majoring in Animal Science, specifically pre-vet. 
And so I would like to welcome and thank you everyone for attending today. It was a really great turnout so far. And I would like to go ahead and present on behalf of K-State Manor Chapter who we have here today. So first of all, we have Jennifer McDonald and Andrea Rodriguez. So Jennifer McDonald is the founder, CEO, and winemaker at Jenny Dawn Cellars, the first urban winery in Wichita. Jennifer spent 12 years leading strategic initiatives from some of Wichita's largest employers. She has leveraged her business acumen and leadership skills from the corporate world into the wine industry. She has a master's degree in agribusiness from Kansas State University, and she has taken wine making courses through UC Davis and is a wine educator at the State University. She has taken, Jennifer has developed and produced research dat data on consumer wine preferences, and she has used the data to launch Jenny Don Sellers in 2016. Jenny Don Sellers started out as a California wine brand producing award-winning wines from Napa. In November 2019, Jenny Don Sellers became a licensed Kansas winery located in the newly renovated Union Station in downtown Wichita. As of 2022, Jennifer has produced award-winning wines from grapes, fruits, and juice from California, Kansas, and Nebraska. Jenny Don Sellers Winery has tasting room offers such as charcuterie boards, small bites, venue rentals, private and guided wine tastings, and wine locker memberships and wine clubs. Learn more about Jenny Don Sellers at www.jennydonsellers.com. So next we will be moving on to Andrea Rodriguez. She is a California Bay native who received her undergraduate degree in animal science and industry from Kansas State University in 2013. While at K-State, Andrea was a participant in the first Project Impact MAPS cohort and was also a member of the K-State Manners chapter. Returning home to the Bay Area, she has spent five years working in small animal general practice along several veterinarians and specialists. Working for Banfield, she has had the opportunity to work and learn alongside teams from multiple states. In 2019, Andrea decided to further her career and become a DVM candidate for Ross University. Thus far, her, some of her greatest accomplishments at Ross have been to serve as the VBMA president, the founder of LVMA Ross chapter, Ross student's ambassador, in addition to earning her certificate as Canel Cornell's CPR basic and advanced life support, fear-free, and F-A-M-A-C-H-A. When she's not studying, Andrea loves adventuring and outdoors and donating her time to the community outreach. And when she's home for break, she can be found spending time with her dog. Andrea continues to push forward on her DVM journey at Ross and is excited to one day open a small animal emergency and critical care practice. We are excited to have these distinguished K-State alumni to speak to today and look forward to what they have to share about. With that, let me hand this over to Summer. Thank you, Selena. Um, so without any further explanation, uh, I'd like you guys to welcome uh, Jennifer McDonald and Andrea Rodriguez. Okay. Well, Andrea and Jennifer, moving forward, I'm going to just go ahead and ask a few general questions and you guys please elaborate as much as you want to. Um, we're here to learn about you, not listen to me ask questions. So please do elaborate. Um, to start out, can you both talk to us about your journey to where you are um, now, how you got there? Sure, absolutely. I can go first. So thank you for that warm welcome and introduction, and I'm grateful to be a part of this event today. So as explained in my bio, I started out in my career field of human resources before transitioning to the wine industry. And I think one of the main takeaways in that transition is finding something in life that you're passionate about that you're excited to get out of bed every day, 
that makes you feel fulfilled and that helps you leverage all of your skills and knowledge for the betterment of the community. And so I enjoyed what I was doing in HR, but really wanted to own my own business and have a greater impact into society. And I felt like wine is a connector and it really brings people together. And when I looked at the different wine offerings that were available in Wichita, I didn't see wine as um, being very inclusive in Wichita. Um, I wanted a place where people could go and learn about um, how wines were made and all of the different aromas and flavors and just really celebrate the enjoyment of, of wine and food pairings. So I saw a need and I chose to further my education at K-State to help me understand what wines people in Kansas really enjoy consuming. And then I went out and pursued um, getting my winery open and launched. So it really came from, you know, me seeing that there was a need for wine to be more inclusive. So as a woman and as um, uh, African-American, there aren't wineries owned by many of us nationally. But in the state, I was the first female African-American winemaker. And so to me, I would walk into wineries. I wasn't always greeted or helped. And I wanted to create a safe space for everyone to come together and feel included in this process of enjoying wine. So I took the leap of faith and through my education, I was able to launch Jenny Don Cellars in 2019 as a physical winery. But I took a lot of time to go back to school, learn the um, basics of making wine. And then I also, spent some time in California to obtain an opportunity uh, for my wine brand to be incubated by a large winery in California that allowed me to produce some wine before opening. So I really tried to utilize all the resources that were available to me through education and experience so that when I opened up my winery, I had a really solid foundation. So I always encourage everyone to follow their passion, find a career path that is fulfilling. Um, For me, I don't feel like I go to work every day. I feel like I get to, you know, engage with the community, enjoy award-winning wine, and really celebrate, um, people coming together, breaking down barriers, and um, really convening over food and wine. Awesome. Thank you, Jennifer, for telling us about your story. Andrea, can you tell us about your story? Yes. Hey, everyone. Uh, Thank you for having me, first of all, and it's so nice to see all of you. And um, again, my name is Andrea Rodriguez. And I graduated from K-State 2013. And um, something that I didn't mention in my bio that happens to be um, part of like my passion, I suppose, is um, business and um, just numbers in general thrill me. So (laughs) um, when I was at K-State, well, let me backtrack a little bit. I've always known, I was one of those students that always knew that they wanted to be a veterinarian from a very young age. And that's never, ever wavered for me. So um, it was, I don't want to say easy, but um, I was just guided very strongly by, by that deep passion. Um, so when I got to K-State and um, I was pursuing pre-vet, I also took a liking to some economics classes and I ended up getting a minor in agriculture economics because I didn't feel there was enough math and numbers in the pre-vet curriculum. So um, I did that for myself and um, that kind of trickled into where I am now at Ross. Um, So to elaborate a little, the VBMA 
uh, which is a club that I was president of back in 2020, is the Veterinary Business Management Association, which is a national club. And there are student chapters at just about all the uh, veterinary schools. So um, when I became president, um, I had a great opportunity to bring in a new advisor. Um, the advisor at the time was kind of phasing out and um, I thought it was really important to like see representation. And um, I was able to get my board to um, recruit a Brazilian uh, professor who um, has a lot of success in owning his own business and practice and um, is just amazing in the vet med field. So um, again, uh, business has kind of followed me into where I am now. And um, I have just been trying to figure out all the things that I want to do in, in vet med because it wasn't very clear when I was at K-State, besides I just want to be a vet. <laughs> um, but now kind of having had more opportunity to network and um, get to know more of the field and what it has to offer, um, you know, I, I know that business can go a long way with that and um, in addition to becoming a veterinarian. Um, so still kind of figuring out what all I want to incorporate into my career and my future, but um, it's been it's been fun and interesting kind of uh, just tackling those things along the way. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrea. It was great to hear about both of your stories. Can you guys, you both kind of touched on this when you were talking about how you got to where you are now, but can you tell us a little bit more in depth about what role K-State played in your success and talk about the programs you were involved in and how they helped you to your future? Yeah, so I'm grateful that I um, attended K-State as an adult learner, and it was through Global Campus, my Master's of Agribusiness program. I started in 2014 and ended in 2016, and through that process, I was able to write a thesis, um, and my thesis, I got to choose the topic and I knew I was getting into wine. So my thesis topic was on consumer wine preferences. And what I did is I had 80 individuals try 24 different wines. A third of the wines were wines that I made at home. A third were from other Kansas growers. And then and the last third were from prominent producers in California. Because there's this um, saying in the industry that um, a lot of Kansas uh, wine drinkers really enjoyed sweet wines. And that was a perception that ended up not being necessarily true. So as I did my research, I found that my semi-sweet to dry wines actually came out on top over the California wines and the Kansas produced wines. So I loved going through that process, meeting 80 people, having them go through a sensory analysis journey. We looked at five characteristics of wine, appearance, aroma, body, taste, and finish. And I had all of the individuals give the wines a numerical score between one and five, five being the highest. And then I did all the data analysis to figure out the top wines. Um, through that process, it allowed me to really put together a solid business plan on how I would engage customers here in the state and turn those, um, those findings into, um, you know, differentiating factors in my business. So I was grateful for the thesis process, but then just the core curriculum and coursework was really around business and financials and understanding how to use those financials and economics to ensure that your business is viable. I work in the weeds and the numbers every day. I also use the science of winemaking every day, but to make sure that my business stays afloat and we have enough cash to operate, 
I'm grateful for all of the coursework that I had through K-State. Um, I started my business four months before the coronavirus pandemic, <laughs> and, which was not an ideal time because um, we had to shut down the tasting room during that time. Um, but having a solid foundation of my K-State coursework and then just network really allowed my business to flourish through the pandemic. And a short two years later, so right now, we've been able to be successful enough to expand our facility and double our case volume, double our square footage, and, and grow our business. So grateful for all of my friends, connections, customers, and learnings through K-State. Awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. It's great to hear about how networking really helps well into the future, um, especially for the students here. You probably have about 40 people in the room if you can't see that, but it's great to have them hear that so that they know how to use that going forward too. Andrea, do you want to talk about how K-State played a role in your success? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just want to say that being at K-State really prepared me very well for vet school, even though I did have like a significant gap um, before going to vet school. I always knew that's where I wanted to end up, but I kind of wanted to get in the field before I did end up going. Um, and I'm so glad I did. But um, again, K-State just really prepared me in the best way possible. And not only the classes, but the programs that I was a part of and the clubs that I was a part of, um, again, networking was a huge influence and um, just talking to people and kind of get ideas flowing and um, figuring out like what options you have and things of that sort. So MAPS was huge for me um, when I started out and I um, am so grateful for that opportunity. It kind of gave me a head start into everything. And um, I also was... Um, a peer mentor for pilots. I don't know if that's still around, but um, kind of, I don't want to call it like giving back, but just being, um, having the opportunity to be a, a tutor or um, just someone that can help kind of guide people a little through courses, especially for like non-traditional students. Um, that has also followed me at Ross, um, being an ambassador, for different companies and for Ross themselves, um, I kind of get to still do that and like just brag about how awesome everything is and everything that I've gained. So um, these programs and clubs, they're, they're very dear to me and I keep trying to be a part of everything I can. <laughs> so um, yeah, K-State has been, has been great to me. Um, and just having the ability to connect with mentors like Dr. Wiley, um, when I met her through Manners, I didn't know how big of a role she would play in my life. So i um, very happy to have met her and still connect with her today. Um, another part of K-State that kind of surprised me is, so I come from California and again, knew I wanted to be a vet, but I kind of only envisioned small animals at the time. And when I went to K-State, there's a lot of large animal emphasis. So um, I discovered that I liked working with pigs, <laughs> um, even though everyone else will tell me that I'm crazy. And working with large animals there actually has helped me significantly being at Ross because a lot of the um, surgeries and procedures that we do are on, are on large animals, excuse me. So, um, that's been really helpful. And again, even though there's been a huge gap um, in my time, it's still, it's stuck so well. Um, the professors there are amazing. I don't wanna name favorites because I don't even know if they're still there, but <laughs> um, they, they're great. And so I encourage you to, you know, have a relationship with your professors too, like outside of the classroom, you know, kind of pick their brain. Um, if there's anything that interests you more, you know, ask questions there because, again, it's going to stick. If it's your passion and it's something that um, you're genuinely interested in, it's, it's just going to stay there. So 
um, definitely recommend that. And um, economics classes, again, be, uh, being a part of um, AGAC, uh, that helped me a lot, not only being in the VBMA club, um, but also just being in the clinical setting. Um, I was surprised just how many of the things that I talked about in class or learned in class uh, popped up just on my day-to-day. -day. And that was just being you know, a receptionist in the beginning or um, being a veterinary assistant or moving on to a shift lead. Like every little thing that we talked about in class kind of sparked up at one moment or another. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to have had like such great professors and uh, having those conversations help me out in the future. That's great. We love to hear how programs have contributed to your futures, especially Andrea. I love that you were in Project Impact Maps and that it helped you as much as it did, especially because like Selena, um, she's a Project Impact Maps scholar now and she's actually our ment mentor for the students in the program. She's one of our two for the College of Ag. So. Hopefully she's, she's wanting to be a vet too. So we love hearing about how the programs have helped in your success. All right, my next question would be, how has being a woman affected your journey? Yeah, I can go next. So um, coming from the corporate world, I feel like there was um, a little bit more equity um, when I would go to meetings, I felt heard. Um, when I was working in team projects, my contributions seemed to be, you know, acknowledged. And then I went out into the entrepreneurial and business space, <laughs> which honest, or I should say business ownership space. And that's where I felt like working with banks and suppliers and vendors was a lot more challenging as a woman. Um, I don't feel like I was always heard or my word was respected because I was on the younger side and um, a woman working in the wine industry. There's not a lot of uh, folks in Kansas um, who are in the wine industry. And so when I would tell people my business plan, they're like, what? you're making wine in Kansas? Like, who does that? And will you have any customers? <laughs> and I received a ton of pushback. And then over time, as my business became more mature and people saw the track record that I was able to um, capture, I felt like I had, I was gaining more momentum and getting more respect. Um, I know for me, I was able to bootstrap my business for the first, you know, couple years, but then I needed to start going to banks asking for loans. And with me, um, you know, making a good salary in HR, having A plus credit, I still had to go to nine banks before I could get the funding necessary for my business. And, and so that was really challenging to go through, but I feel like perseverance and persistence has helped me overcome some of those challenges, but it does feel like at times that there are, there's more work that we have as a society to make things more equitable. Um, I'm also a wife and a mother, so I've been married for 17 years and have teenagers, and so just with me owning a business that has a tasting room that's open in the evenings, I know I would get a lot of remarks like, oh, well, who's at home watching your kids? Or, you know, how can you be a mother and a business owner? You know, so there were a lot of um, perceptions that I had to overcome to let folks know that, you know, I'm taking care of business at home. My children are you know, hardworking, intelligent, well-rounded, great kids, and I'm taking care of my business as a winery owner. But I think it was hard for people to understand, you know, how I could do it all. And, um, and so that was challenging because you can't do it all for everyone. <laughs> Um, I know for me, I have to really pick and choose what I get involved with so I don't overextend myself. 
because um, you have to take care of yourself, take care of your family and take care of your business. So it is a pretty full plate, but I do feel like um, having more conversations and dialogue like this is so important just to raise awareness of, you know, some of the challenges that do still exist for women in business. And I definitely hope to, um, you know, sell my business at some point and then be an investor so that I can pour into other young business owners and support them in ways that um, could help them grow their business. Thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. You're completely right. It's really easy to forget the struggles that people and women especially have to go through to be successful on what they have a goal of doing. So Andrea, can you speak to how being a woman has affected your journey? Yeah, so, um... I guess when I think of this question, I really focus on um, women in vet med. And now, I mean, before, um, it used to be dom a profession dominated by men and particularly um, white middle-aged men. Um, but now, I think um, in the last like AVMA 2019 study, like they uh, put out that the profession is now 63% women. And there's about 80% that are enrolled as students. So there is women everywhere. <laughs> and um, I, I feel comfortable knowing that, um, you know, there's a huge, like, just female presence um, in the profession. I love that. Uh, but being a Latina woman has been kind of a different experience. So there's such a small percentage of minorities that are um, enrolled as students for uh, veterinary school. And um, I think the smallest percentage is actually, um, I think 3% for black students at veterinary schools and, or maybe 2%, which I mean, if that tells you anything, it's, it's such a small group. Um, and uh, just the minority, community combined doesn't even make a dent. So um, I don't really, I don't really focus too hard on how that affects me when I'm working with like my peers um, in like surgery groups or labs or things like that. But there are times where it, it, it's kind of too noticeable that you can't ignore it. Um, so there's been instances where, you know, I, I speak up because I'm, I'm confident in my answer or I'm confident in what we're supposed to do. Um, but because, you know, I'm Hispanic and probably the only Hispanic in my group, um, I'm kind of questioned. And um, that's not the only time that that's happened to myself or um, to some of my peers. So I think, you know, being prepared for that reality that's, um, we as minority women are still trying to, I guess, prove ourselves um, worthy of being in the profession. And um, I think it's important to just kind of build each other up and um, kind of bring those people along with your successes. You need to share that and give, give back to others. Um, or even like um, Jennifer said, it's just having conversations because you don't know how your experience can impact somebody else and help them. So um, I found that comfort with my groups here at Ross, especially being a part of LVMA, which is um, a Latino group that is newly recognized on a national level. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it, but um, student chapters at veterinary schools have been popping up. And so um, that's one of the the clubs that I'm really proud of because we have now um, just more, more sense of community and knowing that we're not alone in these experiences and that we are able to overcome them and that we are worthy, you know, telling each other that, that we're supposed to be here, you know? Um, so that's part of my experience. Thank you both for sharing that. And on that same note, I am sure you kind of looked into it with um, everything that I sent and students, I hope you looked into it a little bit as well, but the theme for this year's 
International Women's Day is breaking the bias. And so with that, I'd like to ask you both, what does breaking the bias mean to you? Yeah, for me, breaking the bias means being your true and authentic self and not being afraid to be yourself and break barriers in your profession, in your um, everyday life, and just how you show up every day. I know that um, I've had to overcome a lot of perceptions about, um, you know, women in wine, just making wine in Kansas, that I now feel that I'm breaking the bias and breaking barriers every day just by being me. And so I think that when you show up as your authentic self, people gravitate towards that. Um, people want to hear your story and your journey. Um, and I think that it's inspiring to others to um, not feel like they have to fit a certain mold or, um, you know, do things that are outside of their character to fit in. I know as, um, as a woman in business, I like to, you know, wear big earrings and I like to, um, you know, have like jazz music in my space and make people feel comfortable with that. Um, I like to listen to hip hop music in the evenings at the winery. So I've created kind of a ambiance and a culture and an environment around wine that is a little bit unique and different. But by doing that, I'm finding people who enjoy that as well. And because I'm being authentic, they feel like they can be comfortable and authentic in my space. So for me, breaking the bias is just showing up as your full self every day and not um, hiding behind some sort of rule that you think you should be following. Um, that's kind of what it means to me. I love that. I love that statement of just authenticity for breaking the bias. Andrea, what does breaking the bias mean to you? So breaking the bias for me, um, I feel like it comes in many forms, uh, like calling out gender biases, discrimination, um, stereotypes, you know, just not being afraid to have those conversations with people and, and spark a different thought or create some type of change um, so that we can all head towards that direction together. Um, but striving for, you know, a diverse, community, um, just uh, creating a more inclusive space. Um, I think I think we need to also like celebrate differences and you know value that as well. Um, some of our differences can actually inspire us. So being aware and not just kind of um, rejecting um, yeah those differences in other people or, um, other, other groups, um, and just trying to, you know, be part of the solution, you know, not, not trying to create more problems and, um, be confident in, in your voice and, um, how you can support others. I think that's really important and sharing resources. I know that's been huge for me and I try to do the same. Um, so, I guess more, more sharing. <laughs> I love that. And then my final question for both of you before we do a little bit of a Q and A session is going to be what advice would you give to students on helping to pave the path to equity? Yeah, my advice to students is don't be afraid to um, ask for your worth. So we all have value. Um, we all have different 
skill sets and bring something unique to any situation we're in, whether that be a classroom or a work environment, your family, your home life. Um, but when it comes to your, your career, don't be afraid to ask for what you're worth. So I'm talking about more when it comes to like pay. I'm talking about when it comes to job responsibilities and tests and assignments. If there is something that interests you project-wise in your work environment, ask for that assignment. Ask to be on that project team. If you feel that you are being underpaid for the, the value that you bring, ask for a pay increase. Don't be afraid to ask for what you're worth. So that would be my advice. Thank you, Jennifer. Andrea, what would your advice be? I have to agree with what Jennifer said. Um, and translating it into vet med world um i think that's one big part that hasn't changed um even though women are now the majority of the profession is we're not paid um what we're worth and we have the same education that men have had in vet school um so just echoing what jennifer said um knowing your worth being um fully trusting in your experiences and what you have to offer um and and voicing that you know not being afraid to do that because especially in vet med, um, there's so much demand for veterinarians. I don't know how many um, people listening out there want to be veterinarians, but there's so much demand right now that you could have your pick. And if they're not offering you what you're worth, someone will. So you just have to be confident and, you know, be direct. I think those are some great pieces of advice that I hope these students take to heart. And I know that I'll try to take that to heart. Um, I'm sure you can see some of the students starting to leave because classes are about to start. Um, so with that, I would like to open up the floor for questions from the students. And everybody, please uh, scan that QR code or go to the link and fill out a short evaluation about the program. Hey, uh, Sor Jenny, how are you doing? Um, I really enjoyed your talk today. I just wanted to let you know that I love your rosé. It's so good. Oh, my goodness. Y'all should go get it. Um, we only sell it at a liquor, the liquor store by... This is not me promoting alcoholism, but <laughs> there's a store. It's, like, by, like, the Holiday Inn downtown. So that's where I got it. And it's so good. Like, yeah. But anyways, I just kind of want to know, what would you tell yourself five years ago? Um, and you, you as well, Andrea, like, what, what would you two ladies tell yourself like five years ago to like not give up hope to get to where you are now? Well, thank you so much for uh, your passion about my wine. So I'm glad you love the rosé. But to answer your question, I think what I would tell myself, my younger self is no matter how hard it gets to never give up and to be persistent, which is advice that I've followed, but I think I've, over time, um, I would get really, really stressed out about trying to follow a certain path, and I probably could have pivoted sooner. Um, and so it's okay to fail forward. Like we're all gonna have failure, and things aren't gonna go as planned, but always try and um, use that momentum to keep you moving forward. So it's okay to fail, but don't ever stop and keep moving forward. And I know what has really helped me a lot as an entrepreneur is just my faith. So I know that, um, you know, if I work hard, that I will continue to be successful. But I think just preparing myself for those challenges making sure that um, I have a plan B to, to pivot if I have failure, but ultimately don't give up. Um, so something I would tell myself five years ago is to not be afraid to take that next step. I know that um, 
when I was working at the clinic, I was so, I felt like I was so good at my job. I, you know, was able to share that in different spaces at different clinics. And, um, you know, I felt comfortable. I, I got comfortable knowing that, you know, I could do this. This is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Kind of not forgetting that I wanted to become a veterinarian, but just kind of putting it on the shelf for a moment. And I needed a good solid reminder um, from someone important that I, I still had that dream. So I needed to take that next step. Um, so just kind of telling yourself to be brave and put that next foot forward. Um, because if it's gonna, if it's supposed to happen for you, it's gonna happen. And if you have dedicated yourself to what you've been doing and your studies and your passion, then you're gonna get to that next step. So um, I think just moving forward, you just have to keep going. She said, thank you. Thank you, Kara. Does anyone else have any questions for Andrea or Jennifer? Um, my question is, what was the hardest thing about starting a business? Like, I know you struggled with like the banks because you're like a woman, but what was the hardest thing you would say? I think the hardest thing for me, honestly, has been building a team to scale. So at one point in time, I could do every task necessary in the business. So I was the winemaker and I made the wines. I was head of sales and I would sell the wines through distribution. I was our tasting room manager. So I'd work with my team in the tasting room and serve our guests. Um, but then it got to a point where I was working seven days a week <laughs> and not spending any time, um, you know, with my family as much as I'd like to. So I really had to hire um, individuals that have the same passion of me as me to help me grow the business. And so now I've brought on an associate winemaker. This individual helps me with filtrations and keeps the day-to-day -day process of making wine moving forward. I hired a chef who helps in the tasting room um, making all of our food. I've hired a assistant tasting room manager so I don't have to be in the tasting room every evening. Um, but giving up some of that control and understanding of what's going on in my business at every moment was hard. But in order to grow this business, I had to let go and really hire some phenomenal people to help me grow my business. So I think that's what was hard is that transition of I can do everything in my business to letting it grow and, and flourish and doing less and less. Awesome. Great question. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for talking to us today, but um, I had a question for Andrea. Um, I know you mentioned that you took a gap year, and I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. So I took five gap years, <laughs> um, and I didn't expect it to be that long. I just wanted to, you know, already be in the field and get a sense of what working in a clinic was, and um, Again, as I mentioned, I started out as working as a receptionist in the front of the hospital, and it was probably the best thing that could have happened for me. I was a little disappointed at the time that I couldn't just start working in the back and being hands-on, um, but it gave me a better sense of how every piece functioned within the clinic. Um, and being the first person that people see in the clinic too is, is huge. Um, because you're interacting with clients, you're kind of setting up a tone, um, you're greeting their pets and they love that. And um, you have control of how the back works. Um, so uh, that's how I started. And it was only, I think maybe four months um, before I transitioned into the back as a veterinary assistant. And um, 
I had been doing uh, like technician duties because uh, the, the techs there were limited there were, or there weren't very many and then they were uh, moving on to other opportunities. So I learned it all very fast. And it's a, it's a great place to just be a sponge and learn from everyone around you. Um, so I was, I was lucky enough to hop around in different clinics because Banfield is just everywhere. I was able to move to different clinics and uh, work with different teams. Um, I was able to um, grow certain teams too um, because I was very well-rounded from being a CSE to or a receptionist to um, an assistant to being a shift lead. Um, so that the whole experience, again, it was so huge for me. It was so exciting. I got so comfy in it because I felt like I could do it with my eyes closed. Like I loved it that much. Um, but that set me up really well for going into vet school because I had all these hours, all this knowledge and it still helps me with my classes to this day. Because when we're going over, you know, treatment or, um, you know, what you would do for a certain case that comes in, I kind of already have that scenario in the back of my mind, like, oh, I remember um, we did this, this and that, but I don't know exactly why. And that's where vet school comes into play and kind of fills in those gaps. So that. That's what my experience was being at the clinic. I hope that answers your question. She nodded her head, yes. I don't think you saw that. But she... Does anyone else have another question? Okay, well, I don't see any, but thank you so much, Andrea and Jennifer. You guys did amazing. Um, I know we all loved learning about your lives and your journeys and just your thoughts on the path to equity and breaking the bias. So with that, um, thank you on behalf of the College of Ag Diversity Programs Office, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, and K-State Manners Chapter. We really, really appreciate getting to listen to you today. Thanks so much for having us. I enjoyed this experience. Yes, thank you so much. Bye, take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.